This is going to be a brief uh, plot recap of Bartholomew Fair uh, from the end of Act 3 to Act 4, uh, Scene 3. Quite a bit happens in here, so I split Act 4 into two pieces. First of all, I want to go back to um, Act 3. When Bartholomew has his gold purse picked, again, just as Overdue is on the scene, uh, he's in the vicinity of Nightingale, and without having any good reason for it this time, because Overdue isn't really part of a, a distraction, Wasp, Mistress Overdue, and Cooks all kind of round on Overdue, surround him, and we see them exiting the stage, leading Overdue away as, as Overdue makes, you know, maybe just a little minor protestation because Overdue now seems to fall in love with himself as a suffering justice. He's going to demonstrate how well a person can suffer, how dedicated he is to his disguise and his project. Um, the critic Richard Levin says that zeal of the land busy is interested in deluding others, but Overdue is interested in deluding himself, and this really seems to be a good way to, to sum it up. So Overdue is being led off stage, and he's, he's heading toward the stocks. So the justice is going to be stocked, which just means he's going to have his feet put into these um, these wooden wooden holders that have holes in them cut to hold the feet, uh, so that you can't you can't get away. Um, Zeal of the land busy is also headed in the same direction. Of course, he's being led off by two officers at the end of his trashing of the gingerbread uh, stand. The other thing is that we find out that Joan Trash and Lantern Leatherhead are really associates. They've been, they look like they're in competition with each other in the play up until now, but we find out that they're, they actually kind of work together so that when Bartholomew pays them all this money for their goods um, and then disappears, leaving off Justice Overdue, they get together and they say, let's split, let's keep all our stuff keep Bartholomew's money, we'll, we'll change um, the way we look so that he'll never recognize us, and uh, we'll get away with his money, and we'll still have everything that we have left to sell. So, so off they go. So Bartholomew gets fleeced twice. He loses his merchandise, and he loses what's left in, in his purse. So at the beginning of the fourth act, we start with um, Overdue, arriving uh, at the stocks, and we meet a new character. We have uh, two other characters here we haven't seen before, Bristle and Haggis, but they're not really important. They're just uh, officers, uh, gentlemen of the watch, who try to keep order at the fair. Uh, the important person we meet, though, is Trouble All. And we find out that Trouble All used to be one of these people, one of these watchmen at the fair, but that Justice Overdue had him uh, relieved of his position. Apparently, uh, in a, another instance of overdue, just not understanding anything that's going on, apparently it was an injustice to Trouble All. And Trouble All has gone crazy on account of this. Um, it has been a terrible blow to his psyche to uh, be taken out of this job by overdue, even though it's just a one day uh, of the year affair. And uh, Trouble All refuses to do anything without Justice Overdue's warrant. He won't. He he doesn't want to get up in the morning without it. He does, you know. Uh, somehow he manages to get through life, but he's always saying he wants Justice Overdue's warrant um, for for anything. Um, and Bristle sums it up this way. Um, Ever since he was relieved of his position by Overdue, he will do nothing but by Justice Overdue's warrant. He will not eat a crust, nor drink a little, nor make him in his apparel ready. His wife, Sir Reverence, cannot get him make his water or shift his shirt without his warrant, the warrant of Overdue. Uh, Overdue is going to, of course, run into trouble while he's going to get us get a sense of all of this. And uh, the, you might say the beginning of uh, the truth of his follies starts to dawn on Overdue when he meets Trouble All and when he hears the way that some of the officers talk about him, about how he's too severe, um, etc. 
uh, it's a it's a moment that is almost reminiscent of King Lear when Lear uh, realizes that he has ruled very very badly that he's been very egotistical, uh, except this is in a in a farce, uh, so we get a different sense of its importance. Um, the next important thing that happens <clears throat> is that we see. Corlys and Windwife with Grace Wellborn with both their swords drawn, and they seem to be ready to get into a sword fight over her. Uh, they have both uh, sort of fallen for Grace Wellborn, and they've probably found out she's got quite a bit of money behind her too, and that ain't bad for these guys. So uh, who is going to get the hand of Grace? Grace says uh, that she would be happy to marry pretty much uh, either one of them, but she can't choose which one. She says, you're both reasonable. That's at least better than uh, what I would be getting with Bartholomew Cooks, and I think that my good graces could make a good husband out of either of you. So um, <clears throat> marriage is not a problem. I think that would be a good way out for me, but uh, we have to figure out a way uh, which one of you gets me. I don't want you killing each other. So they decide on a method. Each one picks a word and writes it in a a little sort of notebook. It's the same notebook. and You can imagine one page. Um, so the word that is picked um, by Corollus, let's see, is Argolus, and the word that's picked by Windwife is Palamon. These are characters uh, in romances who are in love with women. So they're written on the same page. And the idea is that the book will then be handed to some random passerby at the fair who will be asked to approve one word and put a check mark by that word. Then the book will be shut, and the word that is checked will not be revealed until they get back home to a safe spot out of the fair. And Gray says, I will make sure that the loser is somehow recompensed uh, for, for having lost me as, as a wife. And they say this is a very fair, civilized uh, offer on Grace's part. So whoever's word is approved, he's going to be the husband. If if uh, if the passerby puts a check by Argolus, Corlys becomes the husband. If a check is put by Winwife, Winwife uh, becomes the husband. First person to come by is Trouble All. And at first he doesn't agree to do anything without uh, Justice Overdue's writ. But finally, he does put a check by one of those words. Corliss immediately says, which word is it? And Grace says, uh-uh. Remember, the deal was, we're not going to check to see whose word has been checked until we get out of the fair to a calmer, safer spot. You know, a spot where uh, she doesn't want them drawing their swords on each other again. Okay. Now, the other important thing that happens before Trouble All comes by and checks that word, is that Bartholomew is pickpocketed, so to speak, for the third and last time. Um, and Nightingale and Edgeworth work together here as well. A costermonger comes by. A costermonger is somebody who sells different kinds of things to eat. It could be anything from meat pies to, to pears. This happens to be a pear seller. He comes by. And Nightingale uh, sticks his foot out and he trips. Now, to give Nightingale and Edgeworth some credit, they both say, you know, they feel kind of guilty about tripping up this costermonger. He's just a poor man like they are trying to, trying to make a living one way or another. And uh, the costermonger goes down. His pears go all over the place. And... Uh, Bartholomew starts to run around and pick them up. And, and here we get the idea again that the gull is often a crook because Bartholomew has no intention to return those pears. He's stealing the pears from the costermonger. Uh, a typical, very childish, adolescent kind of thing to do. But he's hindered in running around and getting these pears by his sword and his cloak and his hat. And um, Edgeworth and Nightingale very sweetly um, offer to hold these articles for him so that he can better run around and chase the pears. Of course, when he gets done, 
he finds that he's lost uh, these items of clothing as well. Probably the most, uh, certainly the easiest get uh, to get things that he's wearing. Um, <clears throat> later, Edgeworth tells uh, Corliss and Woodwife, uh, I could probably take his liver and if he didn't, and he wouldn't even feel the loss of it, I could geld him, uh, and uh, and he'd never notice. <clears throat> this is how uh, easy a mark Bartholomew is. So they were run off with all this, and poor Bartholomew. Uh, but in, in a sense, we don't feel too sorry for him because he's tried to rip off this poor costermonger. Uh, he's lost his silver purse, his gold purse. A lot of a lot of his clothing, and even more pathetically, he keeps asking various people, "Do you know where I live? Do you know where I lie?" He's like a child at this point, totally lost. Uh, he's been separated from Humphrey Wasp. He doesn't even know how to get home. He doesn't even know the name of the place that he's from. Okay, so um, poor Bar, poor Bartholomew. Uh, that's where we leave things by the end of Act Four, Scene Three.